The safest course is to believe in the moral government of the world and therefore in the supremacy of the moral law, the law of truth and love. Faith transcends reason. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. I remembered hearing a message by the president of Howard University, Dr. Mordecai Johnson, who had just returned from India. He spoke in Philadelphia on his trip to India and the whole philosophy of Gandhi and uh, passive and nonviolent resistance. And I was so deeply moved by the message that I went away and bought several books on the Gandhian, uh, on Gandhi and Gandhian technique. And at that point, I became deeply influenced by Gandhi, never realizing that uh, I would live in a situation where it would be useful and meaningful. I regard myself as a soldier, though a soldier of peace. I know the value of discipline and truth. I must ask you to believe me when I say that I have never made a statement of this description that the masses of India if it became necessary, would resort to violence. I regard myself as incapable in my lucid moments of, having, uh, of making a statement of this character. It is complete independence that we want. I admire freedom fighters wherever they are, but I still believe that nonviolence is the strongest approach. I think it uh, should apply in every situation in the world where individuals seek to break loose from the bondage of colonialism or from some totalitarian regime or from the system which we confront in America. Such incredible words from Dr. Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi, two civil rights icons. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sufyan Sohel, a board member here at Can TV and the host of Change Agents. And I'm Sylvia Snowden, a proud employee here at Can TV and host of Political Forum. We'd like to thank each of you for joining us for this special, King and Gandhi Unfinished Business. You know, Sufyan, when you think about two men from two different countries, from two different generations who both found themselves caught in what you just heard Dr. King describe as the bondage of colonialism and the fact that both of these men emerge as leaders against that colonialism by embracing nonviolent resistance, it, it's truly, truly extraordinary. Oh, absolutely. But as extraordinary as that is, watching that footage back all of these years later really raises many important questions. One of the lasting impacts of colonialism and imperialism in India was its modern caste system. The British manipulated malleable social identities into a form of control that limited the power and respect held by the majority of Indian citizens. They created a system that placed everyone into an inescapable label or group that defined what they could and could not do with their lives. So I ask, have African Americans been living under a caste system as a result of the oppression they've suffered in this country? Have either of our cultures fully shaken loose the legacy of colonialism and imperialism in our society? Are our countries still embracing nonviolent solutions to our problems? And if we're both people of color fighting against imperialism and colonial oppression, why don't our communities work together more frequently to dismantle these systems? And do you know what? We're breaking down all of that today because one thing about Can TV is that we're committed to real conversations about real communities. So we didn't want to let another MLK Day pass or another Indian Constitution recognition pass by just doing the same old stuff. We wanted to have a very nuanced conversation about these issues. So that's what we plan to do this hour. For sure. And believe it or not, our communities did once share a very special connection during Martin Luther King's well-documented trip to India in 1959. 
Here to share more light on King's travels to India is Pushka Sharma, founder and executive director of the Parallax Policy. I'm proud to be a South Asian American born in Chicago. Our community has made iconic contributions to this city. Michael Jordan's personal trainer was Tim Singh Grover. The bean was designed by artist Anish Kapoor, and the largest of all, lit literally, the John Hancock and the Sears or Willis Towers were designed by Fazlur Rahman Khan. These contributions stand on the big shoulders of the 1960s civil rights movement, which won the right for non-European immigrants to equally immigrate to America through the 1965 Immigration Act. However, years before that act would connect America with the world, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. traveled to India in 1959 to study the legacy of the nonviolent movement, which won India's independence from the British Empire. He wrote about that visit in Ebony Magazine, published here in Chicago. We'll discuss the connection between King and Gandhi here tonight. At the same time, we have a tendency to simplify and deify figures like King and Gandhi. We overlook the contributions of others in the civil rights movement, such as Howard Thurman, Ella Baker, Pauli Murray, the gender nonconforming legal scholar, and King's openly gay advisor, Bayard Rustin. Today we celebrate MLK Day and also January 26th, the day India adopted its constitution, its Republic Day. The primary author of India's constitution, which establishes the world's largest democracy, was Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. Dr. Ambedkar, a Dalit or quote, untouchable in the caste system, overcame oppression to receive his PhD at Columbia University and become an international civil rights icon. Dr. Ambedkar ingrained the values of democracy, equality, and freedom of religion in the Indian constitution. Building on efforts of women like Fatima Sheikh and Savitri Bai Pule, he worked to ensure the equal rights of women. Many have highlighted Gandhi's failures to actively support Dr. Ambedkar or to take on caste oppression. Today, caste discrimination and violence continues. In 2020, according to Amnesty International, more than 58,000 crimes were committed in India against members of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Despite the criminalization of lynching, Dalit and Muslim men suspected of harming cows are regularly assaulted or beaten to death by vigilante groups. Violence, lynchings, and discrimination against minority communities are familiar challenges here in America. In the US, we continue to endure the resurgence of violence as political expression, especially anti-democratic, bigoted, and or white supremacist violence. Attacks like January 6th, the shootings at the Club Q Colorado, Emanuel Church, Tree of Life Synagogue, and Oak Creek Gurdwara, and the bombing of the Minnesota Dar al Farouk Islamic Center. These tragedies and so many more painfully demonstrate how the white supremacist movement has embraced public violence again today. Supremacist violence killed both King and Gandhi. Dr. King's assassin, James Earl Ray, associated with white supremacist and Hitler admirers. Gandhi was assassinated by a Hindu supremacist, a member of the RSS, which some describe as the Indian KKK, a Hindu supremacist group inspired in part by the Nazis. Today in India, the Hindu supremacist movement is so powerful that is reported by the New York Times, government officials have proposed renaming a city to honor Gandhi's assassin. Extremist religious leaders call for genocide, genocide against minorities, particularly the Muslim community. And this past December, once again, extremist Hindu mobs attacked Christmas services in different parts of India. These developments are alarming, to say the least. With the two largest, the world's two largest democracies facing a resurgence of supremacist violence that are increasingly collaborating, today we ask that burning question that faced King Gandhi Ambedkar and their contemporaries. How can solidarity and nonviolence win justice and end oppression? Thank you for that insight, Pushkar. It was so remarkably helpful to know this background. 
Now that we've learned some more about the relationship, we should talk more about what we can do this year in 2023 to continue to push the work of King and Gandhi forward. At this time, I am honored to introduce our esteemed panelists. Priya Shah, founder and executive director at The Simple Good and co-founder of the South Asian Solidarity Movement. Somia Shailendra, PhD candidate at Northwestern University. Dr. Alden Morris, professor emeritus of sociology and former dean of the Weinberg College of Arts and Science at Northwestern University. And Cecile de Mello, executive director at Teamwork Englewood. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you. Somia, my first question will be for you. Pushka and I talked a little bit about the caste system. Could you please explain to all of us what the caste system is and how it impacted and continues to impact everyday life in India? Yeah, thank you for that question. That's a very important note to begin any introduction to Gandhi and to begin sort of introductions to India by talking about caste up front. Uh, the caste system essentially uh, gets introduced through a document called the Manusmriti that forms the basis of a lot of Hindu philosophy and a lot of Hindu religious practices, and also for the organization of labor and people at large across the Indian subcontinent. So there are some primarily ideas that one, it, it, it's easy to conflate caste with colonialism, it's easy to conflate caste with Hinduism, but neither of them are are true um, in the sense caste has spiritual, uh, take that again, caste has scriptural basis in Hindu philosophy, but it is practiced across religions, it's practiced across communities in South Asia, and at the same time caste was not invented during the colonial period, but actually ranges long back into the ancient period where it actually where it actually gets its strength actually from um, Vedic practices um, and Vedic uh, notions of purity and pollution that then percolate down across the centuries. And obviously, as a social structure and a system, it changes. It changes with technology. It changes with um, the different sort of um, uh, social movements at hand and reform as well. The, the tone of reform changes, but essentially, Caste, according to the Manusmriti, gives a philosophy of the division of um, the division of society according to varna, and varna essentially means color, um, but it also um, it also sort of stipulates a rank in society for people. Uh, that is inherited from birth. So one cannot change caste, one is actually born into caste. Um, so the sort of five sort of major indicators, and according to the sort of founding myth of all of this, they all dissipate from um, the, the body of the Hindu god Shiva. Um, and, the f and, and there are five varnas born, and the people who sort of come from the feet are um, called shudra, and then there are people who are below that, uh, and they're called dalits. So these people are avarna, so they do not belong in the order of caste itself, and hence they are below caste in a way, and un or untouchable. Um, so this notion of caste, this is a sort of historical run through caste, but uh, caste in its lived experience and its practice is really a metric of purity and pollution. It is really a metric of livability and unlivability that continues to guide how South Asian society at large has deemed value to human life. Uh, and that is, I think, the main takeaway of how it gets applied into different arenas of society, especially how it's taken by um, uh, taken up by the law, how it's taken up in jurisprudence to uh, dictate different conditions of life and livability. So when I want, like the contemporary resonance of caste, in one way is the violence that it creates. It's the violence of Dalit deaths, and as Pushkar had mentioned earlier, it is lynchings. It is. Um, it is the root of a lot of communal violence. Uh, but a caste is also, I guess, a mindset. It is also the mentality of superiority that continues to dominate South Asian presence across the world. It continues to dominate migratory trends of South Asia around the world. Uh, and, and it continues to sort of inflict and interact with other forms of bias, other forms of historical violence. So Samia, let me ask this. Based upon what you just yeah. said, I just kind of want to drop a bomb real fast. So whose lives are, are the most valuable in, in the Indian caste system? Is it the people with the lightest skin, the people with the greatest proximity to, to whiteness, or who, who's valuable and who's not valuable based upon color? That's a very interesting question, because like, when on the one hand, can be equated to color, but really it 
gets divided, the basis becomes the division of profession, right? So the most valuable professions come from the head, according to the founding myth, and those are the Brahmins, people who were employed in temples and were responsible for temple upkeep, had access to scripture and had access to education, um, and hence also controlled a lot of uh, industry, uh, controlled uh, knowledge production at large. Um, and so in one way, the question you're asking is, what is the visual spectacle of caste? Like, how does one determine caste by sight? And in practice, I might say, there is no way of determining caste by sight. But caste is informed so much by racist biases that it is very inf it's very common to sort of use um, to be informed by anti-blackness, to sort of stereotype Dalits as darker-skinned people, and also sort of impose that further on to um, Africans living in the Indian subcontinent, uh, African tribes in the Indian subcontinent, but also how South the South Asian diaspora has sort of had a, like an anti-black stance at several moments in its interaction with you know, black communities in the US and you know, in, in different parts of Africa itself. So Dr. Morris, having heard Sonia's definition of caste and how it operates in India, are African Americans operating under something similar in the United States, in your opinion? I think that it is important to point out that all systems of oppression uh, have parallels. Um, but I, I think we, we, we can confuse this situation by saying that black people uh, suffer under the same caste system as India. What black people have suffered under is what we would call a system of racial oppression. Uh, 244 years of slavery, another almost century of Jim Crow oppression, and it's based on the notion that black skin darker skin means inferiority, so that black people were considered by whites to be inferior. So I think that what we want to look at and be clear about is that in the United States, what we have had is a clear-cut system of white supremacy. And that means that whites are on the top, blacks at the bottom, other people of color in between. And so I think it's very, very uh, critical to uh, understand that when blacks came over as slaves, that they then, their skin color was then equated with the role that they should play in society. And that role was to be at the bottom, laborers to make other people rich and privileged. And so I think it's, we just keep it very, very uh, simple that in America, black people suffer under a system of racial oppression. Now, that does not mean that you know, we had a system of segregation and there's very little interaction between uh, whites and blacks and a system of segregation and so on. But you've always had some movement. You always had some free blacks and so on and so forth. But for the most part, the, the masses of black people are at the bottom because of their uh, skin color. Cecile, I want to follow up a little bit about what Dr. Morris just said about segregation. Mm -hmm. um, do you agree with his assessment, especially in a city like Chicago, where we're clearly a very segregated city, um, do you feel and see a lot of this oppression as well? Oh, definitely. And um, I think people who have lived in Chicago know very well where segregation has impacted black people, the South and the West side of the city. And um, in Inglewood, where I've done uh, a lot of my recent work, and I, and I did a lot of work on the West side, but in Inglewood in particular, you see a community that when white flight happened, mm -hmm. there was strategic disinvestment um, there was um, financial disinvestment. Um, there was so much that happened during that time period in the 50s and the 60s in communities like Inglewood, West Humble Park, North Lawndale. And through segregation was able to stay incubated in those areas and then was able to be um, added upon um, even more so, right? So we see in the 70s and the 80s, um, there's homeowners in Inglewood still, right? They're still black-owned businesses. But the roots of the disinvestment and the segregation policies, especially around financial institutions and especially around um, economic disinvestment, now you're in early 2000s, we're in 2010, and we see all of this displacement. We see public safety as a number one concern. And it didn't happen 
just out of nowhere. It happened through the strategic segregation that happened when white people left the city of Chicago, and especially communities like Inglewood, North Lawndale, Humble Park. And then the, the, the way that, um, to uh, Dr. Morris's point, the racial oppression through city policies allowed it to even increase even more, right? And so a lot of our work, um, people see it kind of as reactionary, but really we are responding to decades of racial oppression that has impacted black people in certain communities that has been allowed to stay there. So I want to ask this, Priya, uh, because I know that in the African American community for sure, that, that there are certain aesthetics that are essentially associated with class, with economic mobility, with social mobility, which is essentially having fair skin. It's said to have given you an advantage. If you look at older historic photos of, of fr free blacks or well-to-do blacks or blacks who've been to college and have professional careers, many of them had extremely fair skin to be black people. And I'm curious to know if the same sorts of cues and tropes exist within the South Asian American community and the South Asian community. Is that same thing there, the sort of fair beauty aesthetic and what it means if you look like that and what it means if you don't? Yeah, it's very similar. The parallels are very interesting. The closer that you are to whiteness, the more beautiful you're considered in South Asian culture. And even if you look at um, mainstream products, uh, beauty products that are sold in India, which is um, based on bleaching of your skin, that is a, a testament of large beauty um, revenue that actually happens in the country. In addition, you actually do get advantages in jobs Marriage is a very important thing in the South Asian culture, um, and you're more likely to get opportunities that, if you're a darker-skinned person, um, you will not be able to receive. Fair and lovely, right? Fair and lovely, yes. <laughs> huh. I mean, that as an African-American, it, it sounds eerily familiar, frankly. So I was curious to see if the parallels were also there in terms of a look. Yeah, I mean, I think as a human being, you're almost valued more the closer that you are to whiteness, right? And so the impact of British colonial rule is very much present in India even still. You know, the closer that you are to whiteness, a lot of models, actresses in Bollywood film, they're all light. You will never see a dark-skinned um, person that's in mainstream media even today. And so when we look at um, the reasoning behind it, I think in South Asian culture, we start to build historic religion and us create association. We create associations with poverty and uh, align that with uh, different points of suffering for darker skinned people. And I think that sometimes we start building in a lot of the inevitable outcomes that happen to our own people based on the colorism that we are creating. I'm glad you said that. And uh, you, know, you raised a good point about being the closer we are to whiteness a lot of our communities, the more successful we may have been. And uh, you know, I know from people in my parents' generations, and I and I'd open this up for all of you, I think there is that trope, right? It's when you have immigrant communities who are able to settle in predominantly white middle class families, they consider um, themselves successful or have made it. And and I think that's something that I've seen across different communities. Why is that such a thought uh, that that's the ideal some of these communities want to live up to. I think whiteness has always, and colonial rule, the impact of it is that, you know, that's what's successful, right? And that's what's beautiful, and that's what's right. And so as we get um, towards our own independence, we naturally fall towards what's the role and what we've seen before and we move towards that. And sometimes it creates this white adjacency, this white bias that we start placing upon our own people. And I believe that's what we're starting to see today if we don't really understand the history of why we believe that this is something we want to aspire towards. You see, I think it's important to understand that this notion of whiteness or being white is beautiful. Um, the lighter your skin, the blonder your hair, the bluer your eyes and all is that if we think about this, this is act actually something that is very silly. Uh, this notion that somehow people who are white looking, white looking, that they are naturally superior, and the darker you are, you are naturally inferior. So that the problem is not so much that 
black people or Asian people or whatever just think this way, but it has been imposed. What I mean by that is, is that if you were light skin, if you're light skinned black, then whites in power have less problems with you. They give you privileges. They give you jobs that other black people cannot get. Darker black people get stopped by the police more. They don't get the same kinds of jobs, in, in, you know, typically speaking. So I think that it's very important to ask the question, still, why is it that in America and across the world that white people feel that they are superior based on something as inconsequential as skin color? And, I, and what I would say is, is that a lot of the violence and all that comes from the white community toward the black community and people of color has to do with the fact that white people deep down know that they are living a lie. Mm -hmm. that, that, that it is a lie to, to say that we are superior simply because of our skin color. So I think that's what we mean when we, when we talk about white supremacy. What is this system that rewards folk based on their skin color and the closeness to whiteness? I think that's the issue. You know what, I think the other issue too, because as I'm listening to the audience, mm -hmm. I'm hearing a lot of mm-hmms, and I'm seeing a lot of head nodding from everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and we have you know, a mixed race audience. There are a sure. lot of people from both the South Asian American background and the African American background joining us mm -hmm. for this conversation. And so I think the, the question is, that we may have talked about what a superior group believes, but, but what do we believe? Because it, if, if we're all suffering under a, a caste system or a system of oppression, parallel systems of oppression, that place value on human life based upon an aesthetic, why haven't we done this more? We have. I don't want to dominate the conversation, but, but, we, <laughs> but, we, but if you go back to the black power movement mm -hmm. and different periods in history, I mean, black people have risen up against this whole notion of, you know, white is beautiful and black is ugly and so forth. So there's always been struggles over this. Let me walk back. Let me qualify the we. Mm -hmm. When I say the we, mm -hmm. I mean, why is it that we so infrequently see the South Asian American community in the room with the African American community saying, hey, we are both suffering from these post-colonial systems of oppression. We both have this thing with skin color. It informs how we see ourselves. It informs how we see the world. Why haven't we worked with one another mm -hmm. to dismantle those systems? Because it sounds like we were dealing with leaders who believed that solidarity was important and equality is important. So why haven't we done that more? Well, I would like to, um, to share also in listening to um, the other panelists talk about um, skin color. So part of my journey in Chicago was I'm also a mixed race girl. So I'm black and I'm Puerto Rican. So in the black community, I was a light skinned girl. But in the Puerto Rican community, I'm a dark skinned girl and did have um, struggles in my own family from one side of the family, feeling inferior because of my blackness. Um, but I understood, because you know you love these people too, right? And I understood that these were the messages that are, they receive when they come to this country a lot of times, right? Especially in Latinx communities. If you are newly immigrated, you are told that black people are not safe, that black people are poor because of their own doings, right? And so it takes you being able to be in spaces where you can build relationships, like in schools, everything from elementary school to college, where people get to break down that misunderstanding. That message is intentionally created by, a, a, by mass media that profits or continues to uphold hold white supremacy. So, and if I can talk a little bit about Dr. King's work, that was part of the work that I feel I have connected the most around is about understanding that poverty and its and its and how it's upheld in this country is across all colors, right? And so um, the work of uplifting communities economically is one of the ways where we get to confront how color is, 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 man, is a manufactured segregation kind of you know, a structure for those of us who are non-white, right? And so um, I hear this a lot when we talk about the Latinx community and the uh, tension around work in America, and especially uh, in the black community. We hear those things about, well, they're coming to take our jobs. Or you hear wh white folks say that, right? If, and that's said a lot about brown people in this country. But that's not what it's really about, right? And those of us who know this work know that no, it's actually about being able to profit off of cheap labor, no matter what color it is, as long as it's not white. 
I, I want to do something with what you just said, if I may. So, Somia Priya, is there any truth to what Cecile said, that when you immigrate to this country, someone pulls you aside and tells you that black folks are the ones at the bottom of the cast here and that we don't work as hard and we're not as intelligent and we're, and we're not as honorable? Is, does that tension exist? I mean, I would say you don't even have to wait to come to this country to really be informed of that, right? Like, I think that is the sort of global presence that anti-blackness takes, is actually it is, it is structured so much in the way we perceive um, blackness as inferior in other settings. And I say this especially because we tend to sort of think of India also in homogenous racial terms. We try to think of so South Asia in homogenous racial terms, but it is a multiracial society. Right. There are black people that are indigenous people. In fact, indigenous black people in South Asia um, who are, you know, the Siddhis and the Shidis, um, and and there is like, you know, structural sidelining of them uh, around South Asia. So the work of whiteness is precisely to sort of come into room. So we have a moment right after the civil rights where something like a rainbow coalition is being thought of, is being thought of among sort of Asian American leaders and South Asian American leaders and black, you know, and prominent black leaders. And why does that dissipate? Because after that, there are a series of immigration legislations that are passed that prioritize South Asians to come and take jobs. And because they're highly skilled labor, they come and do that, right? Um, and what happens in that process is a, you might want to think that after this great movement of the civil rights, that means that there's a lot more um, support that happens back and forth between black and South Asian communities, but it doesn't result that way. Because that is precisely the work of sort of inherent casteism. That is precisely the work of inherent anti-black bias that informs how you approach even a moment like that. So you have South Asians leading several industries in the US today. You can name a tech company, and most likely the head is a South Asian, and that is not uh, that is not so much to do with how great the education is or how well they're trained. Of course, those are all realities, but that is also in that is also informed by a notion and value of superiority that is like born out of the racism of caste, mm -hmm. right? And how casteism has inflicted that you can be in certain rooms, you can be in corporate settings, and be completely all right with the fact that there's not a single other black person in the room, that you can take power as a South Asian and not feel anything about it, right? So I think like it goes both ways uh, when we have to talk about that. I think um, I agree with uh, what Soumya said, but in my experience, our family actually um, was born in East Africa. So um, many South Asians during British colonial rule were brought to East Africa as slaves to build the railroad. Um, and a lot of Indians settled there. So if you look at East African culture, it's very intertwined with South Asian culture in terms of our food, how we dress, even the, our language. So in our, even in our language, we have Swahili mixed in with my native language, which is Gujarati, which I didn't realize actually until college. So my understanding of blackness was really coming from an African root, which my mother grew up with because they uh, worked together and lived next to each other. Um, and so a lot of what I grew up with was that Africa's beautiful. And you know they were kicked out during the 1970s South Asian exodus by Idi Amin. It was a very traumatic time. It was a very scary time where a half a million people were, die were killed um, to anybody that opposed Idi Amin. And my parents witnessed that. And so a lot of the trauma with blackness comes from a war and things that they seen when they had to force uh, to be escaped as refugees back to India and then suddenly come to America. Um, both countries which truly didn't accept them, right, because they're not native to either. Um, so, and in parallel to that though, um, as my parents celebrated Africa, darkness was still not cool, right? <laughs> like we, anytime I got dark growing up, it's like, no, 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 you're too dark, you, you're too black, right? And so um, there is a parallel of an appreciation of a culture, but still carrying on this like, racist colorism of darkness. I kind of want to change uh, and go back to something Sylvia asked um, that I'm not sure we fully answered. Um, we've talked about the problem. I'm a civil rights attorney and working to protect against injustices and fight inequality and racial inequality. And uh, you know what I've seen is so many of our communities were working in silos, as, as we've all discussed. We have our own problems, we have our own situations, but this country is so rich on 
you know, hating anyone who's ever wanted to call at home unless, you know, they're of a certain background or, or whatnot. What are ways that we can support one another in our collective efforts for equity and, and against supremacy, whether it be together or in our individual in our capacities? Well, you know, I want to go back to this notion. I, I think that what we have to realize is that there's no outright conspiracy where people must be told blacks are this, uh, they they worse than you or whatever. Is that is that we have to understand the system of white supremacy. If we if we want to work together and so forth, then we have to work together to try to dismantle the system of white supremacy. The bottom line is is that if, toward the end of the 19th century, Europe dominated the world. They split Africa up. The European countries split Africa up. They split up Asia. They split up South America to themselves. And they instituted this idea that all of these cultures across the globe, dark skin, were inferior. And they used that to, to rule, that they, they had a right to rule because they were white and that they were superior. And so what we, it seems to me that what we have to understand is this is not a matter of, 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 of confronting any white individual or a light-skinned individual. It is to understand how there's a system of white supremacy that is programmed into our institutions that operates behind our backs. And so we are carrying it out every day without even thinking about it. And I think that's what we have to focus on. We have to ask the question, what is this system of white supremacy, and how does it work, and how do you dismantle it? I think that's the issue. Well, let's talk about the dismantling, because we have before us the legacies of two leaders who believed in nonviolent resistance to try to dismantle those systems. I think that one of the things that happened early in the program that was really brilliant was Pushka talking about how a lot of that work is not necessarily being undone, but it's certainly being challenged with a lot of pushback from people who think things should stay as they once were. So what sorts of steps are we talking about understanding what's at stake to move forward? What would King and Gandhi have us do in this moment? What should be next? Um, I'd like to share some local experiences that are happening here in Chicago that I've been able to see or be a part of. Um, there's a multicultural coalition called One Shy for All, and in that coalition we have community groups and leaders from across um, the city. And we work on similar issues like education, police reform, um, uh, economic opportunities, um, and you know, uh, support for youth. Well, one of the things I've been watching this coalition do in the last couple of years, especially during the pandemic, is also make space for when we have a moment where we have to react to an issue and another community it may not impact them, but we allow ourselves to be informed by that community that it is being impacted, and then we create space in wherever we have power or we're forcing power against those who are making those decisions and support that one group in their efforts, right? It could be anything from food deserts to, um, to a, a recent uh, police incident. And so that's where I feel like I've been able to find a really comfortable space around solidarity, where um, I'm empathetic to what's going on in a community I may not understand, but I want to figure out the way that I could leverage what I have to support them, and then vice versa. Um, Next week, we have a call where there's something that's particularly impacting Inglewood, and everyone's like, well, Cecile, where do we support you? And then we have those situations, vice versa. So no, it's not perfect, but um, I think Chicago is a city where, um, because we're segregated, we have to create that space where we can be, um, we can get on the same page of being able to support each other in real profound, deep ways. But if we want to understand Martin Luther King and, and Gandhi, we have to understand that they were leaders of mass movements. Mm -hmm. And what is a mass movement or what is nonviolent direct action? And to me, what is clear is that both King and Gandhi understood that in order to bring about change, you needed more than the courts. You needed more than presidents. 
You needed more than lawyers. You needed the masses of people to come together and be organized collectively to move against the system that was oppressing them. Mm -hmm. So here's what is clear, and is that we can get lost in this notion that King and Gandhi were about love and truth. They were about that. But you know what else they were about? Mm -hmm. They were about building mass movements where those movements disrupted the society to its knees, bring it to its knees so that it cannot govern. And so they were masters of social disruption. The society, same thing in South Africa, the society becomes ungovernable. We are going to stop it from operating as usual. And then once you create this kind of disruption, you then use that as your power and your leverage to bring about change. And so then I think it's very easy for us not to think about how shrewd Gandhi and King were. They were, they knew that the way you bring about change is to generate mass disruption in a society. Stop it from functioning as usual and then bring about change based on those tactics. Thank you for that. There was a lot to unpack there, and we're going to get more reactions from our audience. Before we do that, thank you. But before we do that, we want to have a very special reflection from Dr. Mahesh Somashekar, the Assistant Professor of Sociology at UIC. Dr. Somashekar, what do you think of what you just heard? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me. This is a great discussion, and I think it's a kind of discussion that really needs to be happening more often, so I really appreciate that there's this space for this conversation to happen. And I really like the point that uh, Alden ended on, thinking about the, the need for mobilization and what are the points uh, uh, on foundations on which this kind of mobilization can occur to make these coalitions possible. So uh, I kind of want to uh, uh, bring up some things that I think perhaps should be discussed further and, and pose it to the panel how we can integrate these things into the conversation. So uh, regarding white supremacy, I think, I think it's interesting that, uh, that no one has mentioned yet this idea uh, that I think really comes from uh, the desire to uh, uh, keep wh white supremacy going of thinking of Indians and South Asians as a model minority, as, as opposed to you know, the lazy uh, black or, or, or uh, Latino uh, minority, uh, and, and that being a deliberate tool to divide uh, uh, Asians and, and um, uh, uh, other black and brown people from, from actually building coalitions. Um, I think that you know, there's a Supreme Court case that's coming up on affirmative action, which I think is a really good example of this actually happening. Um, and so I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how that is actually uh, fitting into the, the story you're telling. Um, I also think that uh, I really appreciate the, the, how it's been touched on, but I think should be um, discussed, or I'd, I'd hope to see it discussed further, is the, the diversity in the, in the South Asian community. Um, uh, you know, I think a lot of people in the U.S. have the stereotype in their mind of, of you know, oh, the South Asian, that's my doctor. You know, uh, but if you look at say Bangladeshi Americans, their um, average income in the U.S. is, is lower, much far lower than uh, the U.S. average. Uh, you know, we're we're talking about uh, uh, racial profiling. I mean, Muslims are profiled by the police as well. Uh, it seems to me that there are these real points of you know economic connection, of experiences with the police that provide openings potentially for these kinds of coalitions to be built. And so I'd love to hear a, a little bit about that. Um, uh, also, something that I think was, was really interesting, and I don't have a fully fleshed out uh, question or, or comment, but thinking about this idea of the internalized racism that immigrants take on uh, when they come to this country or even before they, they come to this country that prevents those kinds of coalitions to be, to be built. Um, I'm thinking here, and, and you know, how, how, do, how do we overcome that? I'm thinking here of social science research that recently came out. Uh, uh, talking about how you know one of the ways of maintaining white supremacy is when South Asians are really excelling in school, uh, really trying to penalize that and making it seem like a foreign you know thing to be uh, academically successful. There's just a lot of really interesting ways thinking about youth as you know the future of potential coalitions, how those things can be overcome as well. So, so I really think all of your expertise and your comments have been great. I'd love to see the, these kinds of things being included in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for that. 
I'm Corey Thames, host of the brand new video podcast, In My Own Words. Tune in for the premiere episode this Friday at 7.30 p.m. on Channel 19, featuring my special guest, Chicago City Clerk, Anna Valencia. So, and not just a seat at the table, but power yes. at that table. <laughs> Which we will also talk about with you and your career. <laughs> yes, let's do it. So this is the town hall, part of the town hall, because what we didn't want to have happen was just like have you all listen and nod and clap. You're actually here because we'd love to get your insight and your thoughts on some of what you've heard. So if there's anyone who has a question for the panelists or would like to respond to anything they just heard Dr. Shomashaker just say, now is the time I'm going to, I've always wanted to do this, walking around <laughs> with the mic, taking questions and sort of having this dialogue. So if you would like to respond at this time, please raise your hand. I'll come to you with the microphone. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Rena, and I guess I'll just get right to it then. Um, I was wondering if the panel could speak a little bit more about um, the Aryan ideology and how it's kind of directed white supremacist movements. I mean, of course, we've the most we've heard about it is in the context of Nazism, in the context of Hitler and how it powered the Holocaust. But could we talk a little bit, I mean, if the panel could comment a little bit on how it has shaped white supremacy in the United States and, of course, it having the Vedic origin that it does have, it, it clearly plays a large role in Hindu supremacy um, in the South Asian context. So it would be very interesting to hear the panel comment on that, if they had any thoughts. I mean, I could answer, I think one of the one of the networks I think we can sometimes be careful and we can be noteworthy about is the network between sort of um, an anti-Semitist Aryan ideology with sort of whiteness and its roots and how it gets powered through by Hindu supremacy. Um, I think there is the tendency of Hindu supremacist ideology to control how um, land is perceived geopolitically across the South Asian context in sort of Aryan supremacist terms, which renders sort of, um, you know, marginalized populations as outsiders uh, very often. Um, and besides the sort of xenophobia of this, I think what is in the contemporary moment, what is most important about that is it has powered an entire movement of Hindu supremacy that has used sort of Aryan roots uh, that has like cooked up sort of proto histories of sort of the Aryan invasion to actually make a case for how that um, how disenfranchised people, especially Muslims in South Asia, do not belong. And this is not only historically inaccurate, but what this actually brings to mind is that this has direct roots to sort of neo-Nazism. This has direct roots to how white supremacist movements fuel in groups to do things like the capital insurrection. Um, and so this is really the network of power that we get and we are faced with. And so to counter that, you can't really, to counter that, which is what we can do in a space like this, is to actually think about what is the structural sort of collusion you need to develop as as a thinker and as a citizen of the world to just see like where is sort of structural racism interacting with something like anti-Semitism? Where is structural racism and anti-blackness actually fueled and supported um, by Hindu supremacist ideology? Uh, and how does that sort of pan out when we think about micro interactions of, you know, um, internalized racism or um, internalized, uh, you know, xenophobia? Uh, yeah. But I think it's very important to understand that we can focus on um, uh, Nazism and so forth all we want to, but where did N uh, Hitler and Nazism get most of its ideas along racial lines? It came from the United States. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we need to once again focus on the fact 
that there's this larger thing that's going on historically, and that is to try to understand the nature of white supremacy. So let me just kind of throw you a bomb. We're all concerned about what's happening to the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. And we all, and, and they are seen as real people, just like us, and we should, we should free them and help them get free. Mm -hmm. Then the question becomes, why don't we feel the same way about the Palestinians? Mm -hmm. Because on the one hand, we are here really talking about anti-Semitism, but nobody's talking about the right-wing government in Israel. Nobody's talking about the land being taken from the Palestinians and they're being killed in large numbers. Why don't we feel the same way about the Palestinians that we currently feel about the Ukrainians? And to answer that question is to get deep into what is white supremacy. Hi, uh, my name is Denali, and I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, under my roof, we are black, white, South Asian, and mixed race, and so we have a lot of these conversations. You're all welcome to come to my house to continue them. <laughs> they get really fun. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to ask is, uh, in his final speech, Dr. King talked about a dangerous kind of unselfishness and solidarity, and he was talking about the Memphis garbage strike. And I wanted to say, picking up on your idea of mass movements, what are some really tangible things each of us could be doing in our own communities today or tomorrow to build those mass movements and connections to show our solidarity and to start to work together in a way that, you know, is dangerous to these systems of oppression. All right. Anyone from the panel want to take that one? Um, I could take that one. Um, so I run, I founded and run a nonprofit called The Simple Good. We serve predominantly black and brown youth in Chicago, and I'm a South Asian leader. Um, you don't see too many South Asians out here serving the other, and I don't consider it the other. So I think for us to really move the needle forward, forward is to make authentic, deep connections on a human level with each other and really take in each other's identity into our own. It should not be one type of identity leading one type of people. We should all be leading each other and serving each other on an everyday basis, and that's really how we start striving towards bit larger movements. All right, I'm still watching the clock. We are winding down. Any other questions or comments? Yes, yes, yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you. My name is Tenzin. Um, so our analysis of uh, different systems of oppressions since the times of Gandhi and King have obviously advanced. Um, and much of it, for me, I think, has been the lineage of ideas and strategies from black feminists. Um, like Artie Lord, Barbara Smith, Kimberly Kancha, Bell Hooks, Asada Shakur. So panelists have talked about parallel um, systems of oppressions, but clearly these are interlocking systems of, of oppressions. Um, I haven't yet heard the panelists talk about patriarchy and capitalism as really important systems of oppressions facing our um, um, uh, era and times. And I was hoping that you might be able to shed a little bit light on uh, these additional uh, systems of oppression so that our strategies can be more sharp um, and our tactics can be more disruptive. Thank you. All right, panel. <laughs> Patriarchy and capitalism, what do you have? <laughs> um, I would say um, uh, one, and, and to the question about where are some other local places that we can um, do work right now, but uh, one, there is a, a system that had that capitalism benefits the most off, and it's definitely prisons, and it's also our public school systems. Mm -hmm. And so, um, luckily in Chicago, we have a grassroots strategy. It has been attacked, and it's not always as strong as in moments. But being able to be a part of local school councils or parent advisory councils in some of our local schools, where we can call out the disinvestment in public schools, um, and then also looking at the the uh, the great diverse coalition of folks who are working on prison reform and addressing public safety in a deeper way that doesn't continue to put people in jails and continues to profit that in hurt communities um, across the country and in Chicago. So I think there's um, some ways that we, we can do that work. Um, and uh, a lot of my work has been in public school reform, and that is where I've seen the ugliest of white supremacy show its face in the, um, the overpunishment of students of color, the underpunishment sometimes on depending on what kind of color the student is, and all kind of different ways that uh, young people are, uh, are under that oppression in the most vulnerable times of their lives. 
I think that we um, have to look at the fact that most people in, in the world, and in the United States in particular, experience some forms of oppression. And that it is true that we have multiple interlocking systems of oppression, whether it be patriarchy, whether it be class inequality, racial inequality, and so on. And so what I think we have to try to do is to understand these different systems of oppression and how they interlock and reinforce each other. But I, I would say this, is that it's instructive for us to ask the question, when was Martin Luther King assassinated? He was assassinated when he was putting together a coalition mm -hmm. of groups across American society to address poverty in this country, to talk about redistributing wealth in this country, mm -hmm. talk about redistributing income in this society, and they were making some real movement on this. They were bringing together poor whites, blacks, mm -hmm. uh, Latinos, women, and so forth. These things were starting to come together. Yep. And that was, that was the precise moment where some forces in the United States said it's time for King to go. This is too dangerous because the bottom line is is that all many oppressed people in this society and across the world, they have common interests. The big trick is to illuminate what those common interests are and then to organize and to mobilize around those crisscrossing interests. Okay. Anyone else who <laughs> I mean, I think the history of feminisms is actually a very interesting point because, like, the history of sort of women of color feminisms is very mm -hmm. interested in doing solidarity work. It is very interested in talking to women of color at large and thinking about sort of what are the mutually intersecting structural systems under which they're placed in. So I think that's a very great place to start. I think um, we also know that to take sort of women or feminism as a given category might also be inadequate at times, mm -hmm. uh, because as we see that that, uh, that can sometimes play, that itself is inflected within, um, w within race, that itself is inflected by capital. Um, and, that, and how these ideas circulate are also um, interpolated within those structures, right? Um, and I'm not saying this to really like paint a gory picture, like we aren't going to get out of this at all. But I think sort of attending to feminist methodologies and how we live, how we relate, um, and sort of also seeking out the other within spaces that are familiar to us, spaces that we hold very near and dear, is one of the very simple ways in which we can do that. If, since everyone's plugging a project, if I can plug a project, <laughs> is that one of you know the ongoing work I have around Chicago is to bring communities together through literary text, through a love for literature. I'm primarily a literary scholar, and I do believe that sort of interacting with literary text helps us to get ideas in a more nuanced fashion. So I'm, you know, we, I'm on the hem of beginning um, the trans Chicago Translators Adda, which brings people to discuss uh, ideas as it relates to sort of caste and gender. The first one is literally called Translating Caste, and the second one in April is being called Translating Queerness. So. Like these ideas and the agenda of a space like that is really to create a moment in which we can come together on the basis of a shared literary text or literature and understand how sort of what does it mean to really translate ideas that we know well with each other and what does it mean to speak to each other when we don't always know the same language, when we don't always have the same codes, but are there points at which some of our common interests and some of our conditions in like structural in structure are actually very similar and can lend to a more fruitful conversation. Um, I, I think that like one thing that we should also remember, it's so important for us to understand the history of division between people, but I've lived all around the world in very historic, beautiful places, and what I've also learned about is the history of unity and coexisting. There are so many different cultures in the world where people have coexisted, integrated, and mixed, and it has created into beautiful, vibrant cultures. Actually, every port city around the world where there has been mixture of people because of trade 
trade and business has been the most integrated people of color, religion, and language. And the way that it's become divided is because of politics, capitalism, and racism. And you can see that in South Africa. You can see that in Brazil. You can see that in Turkey. You can see that in India. You can see that everywhere. And it's the same tactic that's always used to separate. So especially in Chicago, where it is very segregated, the strategy behind division is placed upon a strategy of unity. So really understanding what worked together for us to come together so that we can recreate that and um, prevent these tactics of division to happen again. Well, Sufyan, you hear me say all the time, the sort of groundbreaking conversations you'll hear on CAN TV, you won't be able to find on any other network. You can look, but you won't find them. And I think that this conversation has surely been an example of that. I couldn't agree more. I think this has been an amazing conversation that brought to bear a lot of issues that we really don't talk about enough. We'd like to extend our sincerest thanks to our outstanding panelists, our wonderful audience, and each of you at home for watching. We hope you heard something that made you think and that you'll certainly take with you and keep the conversation going. Thanks again. Have a fantastic evening.